So uh, the drought for Europe, I'm afraid, is is really, really bad because it is widespread, very widespread. It is severe to exceptional, and it's deep. And of course, it's last for some years now already. Climate Emergency Forum. We're glad to have you here today. And as we're taping today, we're actually taping on March 15th. Beware the Ides of March. The show today, the European Water Crisis, is going to discuss a continent in crisis. The continent that brought us so much, continues to bring us so much, is in crisis. And it just seems that when it comes to water, it goes from one place to the next. I mean, it's uh, either uh, South Africa, the so southern part of Africa, whether it's the western part of the United States. And now, I mean, it's just incredible that we're talking about this crisis in Europe. It hasn't rained in over a month in France. And France's longest river, the Loire River, is really quite dry. So there are bridges over this river that are bridges over dry land. Yeah, so in February, which we just exited, the most of the Western and Southern Europe has had drier than average conditions. And Northern Italy is having a terrible time. It, the rain is not enough for many of their crops. Crop yield is suffering. And tourism is actually suffering. Well, how is that? Italy's famous for their fabulous skiing, but if they're not getting enough snow for people to justify flying there or taking the train there or driving to ski, they're going to lose out on many, many tourists. So it's a very big problem. When I think of Venice, I rightly think of a town that's sinking and water encroaching but I've seen lately pictures of gondolas just mired in mud because water's retreating because of this drought. It's a very frightening concept. There are a lot of repercussions. We see that there have been a lot of refugees over the years who have traveled to Europe. I know that a lot of them are from war situations, but a lot of climatologists do believe that a lot of these wars these disruptions are the bottom, the basis of them is water, for example, Syria. So it's a, it's a rather insidious thing, if you think of it, that people who survived conflicts that at the bottom of those conflicts was water, they moved to another continent for safety, and now that continent is facing drought as well. Granted, I'm not saying it's to the same degree, but it's the same issue. And it just goes to show there really is no escape, is there? Is there a safe place? When it comes to water, we have three days, three days maximum that we can live without it. We can't live without water. It is the most vital thing for living beings, second only, I would argue, to air. So it's a really important topic, and I'm interested very much in hearing what you have to share with us about it, Paul. Yes, uh, thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine called. He lives in Europe, in Switzerland, and he started telling me about some of the things that Europe is facing that he's seeing with his own eyes. So I've been investigating it quite a bit more since then, and what he's told me sort of has really panned out. So here's some of the basics. The summer of last year, of 2022, Europe had a widespread drought, a one in 500 year drought. Over the winter, when they normally get their precipitation, they've had very little precipitation, whether it be snow or rain. This spring, the drought has continued up to now, middle of March, and it's as bad as it was now than it was 
at the peak of the drought last summer. So this year, the drought is, has occurred four to five months earlier than last year because of the lack of winter precipitation. So reservoirs, lakes, and rivers are down 50 to 60 percent. Some of them have, as you've mentioned, Regina, in some areas have completely dried out. The drought has reached up into northern Europe already. So the Rhine water levels, for example, are down so that barge traffic, which is very important for Europe, similar to how the Mississippi is important in the U.S., barge traffic in the Rhine is requiring half the weight. They can only carry half the cargo so that the draft of the barge is uh, small enough, low enough to allow it to still transit the Rhine. There's nuclear power plants uh, in Europe that are on, they use cooling water from rivers, lakes, reservoirs, etc. And the water temperature is getting too high. There's regulations so that when the intake water to cool the nuclear plants is above a certain temperature, they have to throttle down the power. This is, of course, always a problem in the heat waves in the summer when people need the air conditioning to cool their places. The Sahara Desert seems to be crossing the Mediterranean, if you like to think of it that way. This is because of jet streams extending upwards from the south, covering lots of Europe being stuck in place so that there's persistent drought. I've talked about a number of years ago about the idea that the Arctic sea ice is really key because we're losing with the loss of Arctic sea ice and we're near record lows right now. In fact, I think second lowest and it's supposed to be when it's at its thickest extent in the Arctic. With no sea ice, the center of cold, if you like, will be Greenland, 73 degrees north. So not only is the jet stream slowing and becoming wavier and stuck, but I believe that it's actually shifting down towards rotation about Greenland, center of Greenland, as opposed to the North Pole. That would mean that the jet stream often runs, it doesn't hit parts of Europe that it used to, and it would carry storms carrying precipitation. So I, I think it's all connected as a part of the climate system disruption. The Alps and areas that are great tourist spots for skiing have been open somewhat only because they've been making snow. They're at elevation, high altitude, and if, if the temperature drops a few degrees below zero, they can produce snow. And you see it, pictures of it, and there's just some snow along a skiing path and no snow elsewhere. Now, the snowpack on the Alps, of course, the water from that fuels uh, acts as a source of many rivers in Europe. So with snowpack at near record lows, those rivers are going to dry out in the summer. Some are drying out already now. Contrast that to, that to California. They were worried about the snowpack in rivers just a couple of years ago. And because of what California is experiencing, they've had their 11th atmospheric river. They have record snowfall in the Sierra Nevada. You know, I saw an image of ski pylons with the cables for ski lifts. The, there's 42 feet of snow drifts in the photo. Somebody's walking on top of it, and they can actually touch the pulleys that are at the top of these ski lifts. Of course, when this melts, if it melts quickly, it's going to cause all kinds of, of problems. So there's extremes all over the world. Depending on where you are, you may have a record drought, you may have uh, record temperatures, record um, precipitation, what have you. We can't assume that Europe will always be in drought, but if, the, if it is a shift of the jet streams, then, then it probably will be. But there could be some ENSO connections, and we're, we've had a La, La Nina for three years, we're heading to an El Nino, and that can shift patterns. So we'll see what happens in the next few years. Your people in Europe are extremely concerned about where they're going to get adequate fresh water. Indeed, they are concerned and as well they should be. I mean, drought has been affecting Spain off and on for many years, especially southern Spain. But all of Spain has been in drought for, I believe, over a year now. Uh, so much so that 
laws have been instituted to limit water for agriculture by 40%. A 40% reduction for uh, water for agriculture is substantial. Of course, that will affect what crops are planted and the yield. There's been a 15% uh, reduction for industrial uses. And people, individuals have had to cut their use of water from 250 liters a day on average to 230 liters. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if can you imagine 230 liters a day for your shower, for your cooking, for your cleaning? It's not a lot. Uh, so those are pretty severe reductions. Peter, what are your thoughts on the drought in Europe? So um, drought is one of those things that we're getting amazingly clever and brilliant at recognizing it and monitoring it and following it. But we're being incredibly stupid at really not paying any attention to what we are discovering is happening. It's, it's absolutely absurd. So there's there's a great site that, that I follow for drought. Um, it, it was put together by the USNOAA, and it's a combination of U.S. Uh, intergovernmental organizations and European. And they there you, they have a site in which you can see more than a dozen ways, technologies of recognizing drought. They are all, at the moment, for Europe, absolutely, absolutely awful. When I look at the uh, these drought maps, and they're all as bad, and the fact that they're all as bad by different techniques, of course, confirms that they're all completely accurate. And it was very, very interesting. Thanks, Paul, for giving us that um, personal uh, account right of what it's like for europe there um that that was really great so uh, europe is in the most severe drought it's called exceptional drought um by the drought monitors the western central europe at least two-thirds of that is in drought and the vast majority of that is exceptional drought i, I noticed that uh you know ireland you know shamrock um, where it rains all the time and it's always green and the grass is wonderful ireland is in severe drought Severe drought. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. So uh, the drought for Europe, I'm afraid, is, is really, really bad because it is widespread, very widespread. It is severe to exceptional, and it's deep. And, of course, it's lasted for some years now already. So one of the, uh, one of the monitors is a groundwater monitor. And the groundwater uh, result is just as bad. It's uh, this deep, deep, deep red all over the vast majority of Western Europe and Central Europe. You have to resort to groundwater um, and rivers and the lake when uh, you have a severe drought on the land. Um, but looking at the groundwater, it is severe. We really are looking at a catastrophe here because of the severe depletion of groundwater the technologies of the satellites, of course, are absolutely amazing. So we have what uh, is called the gray satellite that can tell us what the uh, soil moisture is like, which, of course, is the most important thing. And they uh, now can do deep soil moisture down to the roots of the plants and the vegetation, as well as the, the surface soil moisture. It's all terrible. It's all just as bad. And it is intensifying. Um, because there's a site out of Madrid, actually, um, a, a Spanish government site that uses um, a sophisticated drought index called SPEI, the Standardized Precipitation and Evaporation Index. And that I can go back month by month by month, and I can go back two years. And this drought already, as Paul and his friend indicated, this drought at this time of year is intensifying and it is as severe as last year's drought was. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, that was really informative. I think it's important to mention to our viewers, there are five levels of drought. So there's one that's called DO or D0, that's abnormally dry. And then it goes to moderate drought, that's D1. And with moderate drought, you'll see some crop failure and some reservoirs are low, and there'll be voluntary water use restriction. And then after that is severe drought, or D2. And there you're going to see the fact that 
uh, crop or pasture loss is likely and fire risk is very high and the water restrictions will be imposed. After that, we have extreme drought and exceptional drought. And both of those are what Peter's talking about. And those are the very scary drought because that's where you have very high fire risk. You have shortages of water in reservoir streams and wells causing water emergencies. It's a very serious issue. And thank you for bringing up those categorizations, Peter. Paul? Yes, thank you. So just want to remind people that throughout human history, of course, water, access to fresh water, to drinking water has been, is, has been vital. And you can actually trace the development of civilization, for example, cities being along rivers or along lakes or along coastlines, you know, and the reason why the cities are where they are is because of the access to, to water, to fresh water. So as the water access uh, changes, uh, you know, if a region is in drought, rivers dry up, it's, it's hugely problematic. Of course, some cities have been developed in the pier where they shouldn't have. The best example is Las Vegas, you know, build a huge city in the middle of the desert, and then you need to build a massive dam system. And then it turns out that the water levels in those reservoirs hits record lows. Maybe there'll be some recharging from meltwater now that the Sierra Nevada has record snow amounts. But basically we need to prepare as much as we can for for these extremes of drought you know whether it be working on techniques to extract water from the air if we're going to have this weather whiplashing of massive floods and massive drought and then massive floods we need to use the years of massive floods to ensure that water gets down into the ground water peter mentioned the the grace anomaly satellites there are two satellites orbiting the Earth that are a couple hundred miles apart, and the distance between them is measured very accurately with lasers, laser radars. And when the two satellites in tandem fly over a mountain, they're both drawn to slightly lower orbits and they're drawn closer together. So you can measure that distance with the laser and you can correlate it to the mass in the, of the mountain or of the Greenland um, ice sheets or of Antarctic ice sheets or of groundwater, for example, how much, you know, the gravity does change across the surface depending on things like how much groundwater is under the ground. So we can actually measure the changes with this satellite very accurately and it paints a messy picture for Europe and in fact, it shows that the groundwater depletion started happening significantly in Europe in, in 2018. So it's been getting worse in the last four or five years. Peter mentioned it's all red on the map now. So groundwater is very, very low. So people in Europe are extremely worried. They're extremely concerned. I mean, Europe seems to be getting a lot of negative uh, impacts, negative consequences of our rapidly changing climate system. It seems that the, the Sahara Desert characteristics have crossed the Mediterranean and, you know, are leapfrogging into Europe. And this could become sort of a, a permanent feature. I think in France, they said, the government said that France needs to get used to 40% less water than they, they've enjoyed, up, you know, so, so it's a very serious situation. Getting used to 40% less water is something that's really unfathomable, isn't it? But it's something that we're going to have to look at. And it's right. Thank you both for bringing up the important issue of groundwater. I mean, in California, you brought up the atmospheric rivers. When we have this drought cycle and then these rains, and then the ground is so hard that when it rains, the, the rain just runs off. It doesn't soak into the ground. It doesn't seep in. It doesn't go into the ground as um, one would hope. And so there's a, a great loss of opportunity to have that reservoir of water that civilizations depend upon. So Peter, 
So Europe is in the middle of a big northern hemisphere problem uh, of global warming, and it, it's not recognized. The northern hemisphere is heating up fast, fast, fast. The past three months, the northern hemisphere temperature increase was 1.64 degrees C. So it's hot everywhere in the northern hemisphere, very abnormally hot. And as long, of course, as fossil fuel corporations, as the hell of governments and the banking industry uh, continues to pour global heating carbon into the atmosphere, it is nothing is more certain than it is going to get worse, worse rapidly. The other thing um, I, I totally agree with Paul, we've discussed the problem with losing our air conditioner um, uh, or, or losing our deep freeze up in the uh, Arctic, and that's definitely a factor, I'm sure. The the other thing, though, is that um, the Mediterranean is, is like um, a hot tub, and I'm sure that that's producing a problem as well, because, boy, um, when you look at the temperature indicators, see, uh, the surface temperature, the med is really hot. I, I've got to say that for years and years and years, I've always been very worried about the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, for decades, we've heard quite properly you know, that the tropical and low latitude regions are going to get hammered, and they are being first and worst. Um, but what's happening with regards to the northern hemisphere is, is my worst, worst fears. That uh, temperature is accelerating. It's like it's going straight up, uh, like there's no stopping it. So um, I think the uh, northern hemisphere countries, hopefully led by the European Euro Union, are going to get very, very serious about their self-protection. Um, about their self-interest and about their future. They got to get together and intervene on a massive scale. We do, as Paul said, we do have to do a huge adaptation with regards to water security. And presumably this should be possible. We're getting more and more water, right, out of the uh, atmosphere. Um, but that's a vast global project, which could be done. You know, reservoirs, pipes, it'll all have to be done from scratch. It'll all have to be reinvented and redone. We got to start doing things. We got to start responding to our collapsing, crashing climate. Yes. And just to add to Peter's comment, it's the, you know, when we think about the warming, we think mostly about warming of the atmosphere, right? Warming of the air, because that affects our weather, it affects us. But of course, remember that 90% of the heat warming on the planet is warming of the ocean. And of that, something like 70% at least is warming of the southern oceans. But because of the heat capacity of water, if you've got a certain amount of heat, you're going to warm the air temperature much, much more than you're going to warm the water temperature. So that's what's happening. I mean, the southern oceans are warming but because they can absorb so much heat, we're not really seeing that signal so much as we are the, the small percentage of overall warming that is happening in the air is causing all of the problems that we, that we see. And the next strong El Nino is likely to push the global average temperature above 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is my worry. Peter was saying that in the last three months, the Northern Hemisphere has warmed 1.63. And this is in weak, La Nina to neutral state. You know, we're, it looks like the La Nina has just ended officially. It, the, the indexes that watch it say it's over. We're in a neutral state and we're actually heading to the, the El Nino where we get a lot more heat coming out of the ocean. And that's likely to cause tremendous turmoil in the next few years, especially if it's a super El Nino. Everybody has to recognize how huge, how enormous this is. And the adaptation and mitigations have to be huge and enormous. I think that's my point. Everyone has to realize how huge and enormous this is, Peter. And I appreciate your bringing that up. You know, we see a lot of people talking about adaptation. There's nothing to adapt to. Climate change isn't real. Water's plentiful. We need to break through this denial. We need to start mitigation yesterday. We need to start adapting yesterday. And I appreciate you bringing up these critical points. So water is something that's incredibly important. We all depend on water. It's critical. It's important. And of course, something around 2% of the world's water is potable. Well, if we destroy that 2% with PCBs and 
agricultural runoff, we're really going to make a mess of things. So we need to protect water so that we can protect life on earth. And we want to protect life on earth because we value it. We value it. And that's why we're all here. And we value you. And we value the fact that you care about the planet and what's needed to be done to save life on planet, to save our precious, precious resources, to save the one planet that we know of anywhere that is capable of sustaining life. That's what it's all about. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining our channel, for liking, sharing, and subscribing. Thank you for leaving your comments. If you are in a place that's been experiencing drought, we would love for you to share your story with us. Please write it in the description below. Now, on the other hand, if you're in a place that is experiencing atmospheric rivers, these are the two twins of drought. Share that as well. We would love to hear your story. So please leave your comments and we'll look forward to seeing you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum. Thank you.